Thank you for joining today's webinar, Containment Feeding, Optimising Sheep Health. My name's Jodie Rizzay O'Brien, and I'm one of the AWI Extension SA team. Today's webinar is supported by um, Australian Wool Innovation, the South Australian Sheep Industry Fund, and the Department of Primary Industries and Regions. If you'd like to know more on AWI Extension South Australia, you can go to our website, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Today's speaker is Dr. Colin Trengrove from ProAg Consulting. Colin has been the principal of ProAg Consulting, a whole farm consultancy business based in South Australia since 1996. A farming background led to a career interest in ruminant nutrition and health, spanning employment in a range of industry roles, livestock consultancy, mixed veterinary practice, the APAL Ag Lab, Primary Industries and the University of Adelaide. Cole's passion is to optimise animal health, welfare and production through a better understanding of nutrition and sustainable livestock production. And he's recently submitted his PhD on mineral nutrition in sheep. Today's webinar follows on from some highly successful Sticky Beak Days we've held statewide during March and April. So over to you, Cole. Thank you. Rightio. Uh, so containment feeding uh, and uh, optimising sheep health. So I gather many of you may have attended the recent seminars about the um, uh, nutritional side of uh, containment feeding put on by Deb Scammell. And so this is a bit of a follow up just talking about animal health issues. And uh, I appreciate my main slide here is not necessarily the typical containment feeding. In fact, that's more of a uh, feedlot but um, it was an illustration of anim animals anyway, confined uh, and fed um, apart from pasture. Okay, so if we uh, move on to the topics for today. So these are the topics that I was uh, provided with as a result of the, uh, of the recent seminars. And uh, my first one was not one of the topics, but uh, in addition or shy feeders, and I'll put that up there because the last couple of days I've been visiting lamb feedlots, actually um, doing a survey for um, with the hope of developing a vaccine for pneumonia. And uh, several of the lambs I actually have, did post-mortems on uh, were actually suffering from inanition. So these were ones that uh, had failed to adapt to the diet. And obviously uh, we're not getting the energy and so effectively we're in a state of starvation. Uh, and hence the reason why they were euthanized. But it's just to highlight the fact that um, this is an issue with potentially um, any sheep going into a confined space or a containment area. And uh, there are always going to be some that may not adapt to a, a grain diet readily. So it's important to recognize these early and, and pull them aside. Basically, either turn them back out to pasture or uh, put them in an area where there's a uh, lower stocking rate and they may ad adjust and obviously give an adequate access to an alternative feed. But that's all I want to say about um, in an issue. So if we move on to um, uh, firstly, hypocalcemia, but I've just put this up as a preview uh, at, at my little uh, token touch on new nutrition requirements. And so this table here is out of the NRC uh, guidelines 2007 for nutrient requirements of sheep. And if we just work on a typical AU, basically uh, being around about 60 kilos, we're talking merino ewe, maybe heavier for um, crossbreds or um, maternal breeds. But uh, this table highlights that um, a ewe or weather at maintenance will eat about 1.7% of its live weight daily. We sometimes round that off to 2%. So if we said 2% of uh, a 60 kilogram uh, ewe would be around about 1.2 kilos, whereas 1.7 is just on a, a bit over a kilo. And uh, if you look at um, the, the recommended diet for a dry sheep is um, eight megajoules of energy a day. Uh, eight megajoules is uh, an average quality hay. And uh, if we say for a 60 kilogram ewe eating 1.7% of its body weight a day, that would equate to 8.2 megajoules. So if, as I say, average quality hay would should be that good if, and good quality hay should be nine megajoules per kilogram of dry matter. But what I want to focus on here is the mineral content. Uh, and so we normally say that um, a dry sheep should be eating around about two grams per kilogram of uh, calcium or around, and that's around about um, uh, two grams in this case, well, on a 1.7% intake. 
However, if we move through to the last 50 days or eight weeks of pregnancy, we see down here that the uh, the percentage of live weight required to sustain that animal has gone up quite substantially, almost 2%, uh, sorry, almost double, should I say. Uh, and uh, if we look at that in terms of energy requirements, we see here that uh, an energy in that latter stages of pregnancy needs a higher density diet. In other words, more megajoules per kilogram of dry matter. So it's gone from eight up to 10. And so 10 megajoules per kilogram of dry matter is equivalent to about um, a kilo of uh, grain, uh, whether we're talking uh, oats, wheat, barley. And uh, if we actually do the sums here, so 2.7 of 60 kilos is, um, what's that about? We've got to to think about it. So it's around about, say, 15, 16, 16 kilogram, uh, 16 megajoules for a 50 kilogram sheep, 16.2 megajoules for a, a 60 kilogram ewe. So we've gone from 8.2 for maintenance up to 16.2 for an animal in the last eight weeks of pregnancy. Uh, and so that's often something that people fail to appreciate that the, um, the, the incredible rise in energy requirements for the uh, late pregnant ewe. And so no longer is a, um, a bale of average quality hay suitable. Now we do need to be getting into a higher density diet, which is uh, if generally at least a substantial proportion will be grain. Uh, and correspondingly, we see as the uh, animal gets into those latter stages of pregnancy, the fetus or fetuses, uh, the bone development is occurring. And so there's a much higher requirement for calcium. Uh, and especially when you go through to lactation, because the ewe is putting a lot of calcium out in the milk. And so here we see that um, the calcium requirements have actually quadrupled. They've gone from two grams uh, from a dry sheep at maintenance through to eight grams in that last six weeks of pregnancy. And it doesn't, um, that sort of plateaus out a bit when we get into early lactation, but uh, needless to say, we've got a fourfold increase in calcium. And so where's that going to come from? As we introduce grain in the latter stages of pregnancy, uh, grain is notoriously low in calcium. It's actually got a phosphorus calcium imbalance. And uh, so you can't be relying on uh, add, adding grain to the diet to ensure that there's enough calcium in the diet. So we really do need to provide a calcium supplement in that last, um, from the last 50 days of pregnancy onwards. Okay, so, uh, and I just realized this is out of order, but anyway, um, one of the issues with putting animals onto a grain diet is that you risk causing um, what's well, locally known as uh, grain poisoning or grain overload. Technical name is acidosis. Uh, and the reason that this occurs is introducing animals onto grain too quickly. In other words, some people try to accelerate that, putting them onto a full grain diet in one to two weeks. Now, with some uh, supplements, you are able to achieve that, but most of those are no longer available, such as escalin, which was commonly used to introduce them onto a full grain diet in a week. But that's uh, sort of no longer condoned because it is a antibiotic. Uh, and anyway, the consequence of introducing onto grain too quickly is a rapid drop in the pH. The pH in the rumen drops below six uh, from all the uh, lactic acid produced from the quick digestion of that grain in the diet. And uh, as a result of that, it causes the uh, microbes in the gut uh, to die off. And if you get a substantial reduction in the microbial population or the biome, biome in the rumen, uh, that results in an endotoxic shock. Uh, the animal's rumen is no longer able to digest grain, but the uh, shock as a result of that often will co cause sudden death, or at the least, it will cause them to be uh, dull and depressed. You may see lameness develop. Uh, they become recumbent. In other words, go down on their haunches or on their side, become inappetent. Uh, and over time, depending on what um, degree of damage has been done to the rumen, microbial population, they may slowly recover or otherwise they suffer sudden death or may die over the next few days. And so when you do a post-mortem on these animals, you'll open up the room and you'll find it's just full of grain uh, in a undigested or semi-fermented state. And uh, okay, you can say, okay, there's a lot of grain there, but it doesn't necessarily mean that was the cause of death. But if you use a pH stick, which is what this little instrument is here, and put in there, you'll see the pH is somewhere between probably five and six. 
uh, whereas it should be well above, above six. In fact, it should be very similar to what the ideal pH is in the soil, which is around about 6.2, 6.5. So as soon as that pH drops below six, you kill off a lot of the microbes that uh, basically facilitate the uh, fermentation and digestion process in the rumen. What can we do about it? Well, if you look up the textbooks, they always say, oh, give the animal a drench with two or three uh, ounces of bicarb soda, uh, which is really um, not having a lot of impact. You really need to put in anywhere from 200 grams up to a kilogram of bicarb soda, because if you think of the rumen being a 35 to 40 kilogram vessel or vat, uh, you really need to put a lot of bicarb soda in there to raise the pH. Essentially, bicarb soda is an alkalizing uh, treatment. So you're trying to bring the pH back up to that six to six and a half range uh, to stop the damage. And uh, so if you're putting in at least um, two, two to four cupfuls of bicarb soda, uh, drenching it or mixing it in water and, and drenching it in, uh, that has some benefit in raising the pH. A better option is actually to um, potentially drench the animal, pick, pick up a bit of fresh dung from a few healthy animals and mix it into a slurry and drench that down. And uh, that's going to be much better because even though fresh dung, most of the bugs are being killed as they pass through the gut, there's still about 10% or more activity of microbes in that fresh dung. So by grinding that, well, not grinding it up, just make it into a slurry and drenching the animal, you're actually repopulating the rumen with some healthy uh, uh, microorganisms. So that's a far better option to reestablish pH and rumen function than just to give them a, a big dose of bicarb soda. But best of all is actually if you're able to get gut content from a healthy animal, in other words, where you've still got all the live microbial activity, uh, you only need 100 mil of that um, solution. Uh, and that's a three star, that's a far better option to reestablish a normal gut for the animal. So especially in valuable animals, it's well worth getting gut content from a healthy animal uh, and, and drenching those um, valuable animals that have had a, a bit of a bit too much grain. How do we do that? Well, you can actually have a sacrificial animal and uh, and take the uh, gut content from that animal and uh, and drench it into the uh, suffering animals, the ones that are suffering the ill effects. Or otherwise, you can actually, um, you know, it, uh, from a veterinary perspective, you can put a little stomach tube down the rumen, pump one or two litres of water into the rumen, and then siphon it back out. And that way, you're getting a quite a healthy slurry of fresh microbial uh, organisms to um, to then drench another animal that's suffering from the uh, the grain poisoning. However, from a preventative perspective, um, far better to just introduce the grain slowly. It's always recommended to do it over about three weeks, where you might start with eighty percent hay in the diet and twenty percent grain, and then every two days uh, you double the uh, grain content. So, for example, if you're starting off with say fifty grams of grain in the ration. In two days time, you double that to 100. In another two days, you double it to 200. Uh, then you double it to 400, 800 and so forth. And so within two to three weeks, you've increased your grain in the ration up to about 80 to 100% of the diet. Bearing in mind though, that if you're actually 100% grain in the diet, you've got, you're have always running the risk of causing acidosis because you really need a certain a proportion of fiber in the diet to ensure that the, uh, the rumen remains healthy. So we normally recommend probably at least 10 to 20% roughage in the diet. In other words, 10 to 20% of hay uh, and not, not a full grain load. Uh, another preventative is actually just to put a bit of bicarb soda in the water trough um, on a daily basis. Now, 2% bicarb soda, you don't want to put too much in because it does cause an alkalizing effect and so uh, makes the water less palatable. But 2% bicarb soda is equivalent to about um, a teaspoon of uh, bicarb in a half a litre of water and I've drank that without uh, too much drama so um, you yeah, know that's that's quite a safe level. Okay so moving on to uh, calcium deficiency and uh, I'll just start off by the, looking at the big picture so calcium deficiency can be broken down into several uh, subheadings so hypocalcemia which is the, the true milk fever as I refer to it uh, which I'll refer to in the next slide uh, and that's the one that primarily we're concerned with, with uh, late pregnant and early lactating ewes and cows for that matter. 
uh, osteoporosis. So that's where we get thinning of the bone with age. Uh, and so all of us that are over 50 uh, will be suffering that to a less certain extent because the body becomes less able to absorb calcium as it gets older. So for example, a, a five-year-old cow or a five-year-old ewe, the ability to absorb calcium is reduced and also the ability to uh, retain it is also reduced. And so uh, they, we tend to lose more calcium as we get older. And so instead of having nice density in our bones, uh, the bones tend to thin out. And that's what we call what is referred to as being osteoporosis. And so the bone is less able to store calcium and also uh, retain its strength. And so animals do become more prone to fracture as they get older, as do humans. Uh, the next value of calcium is uh, uh, it's a known uh, calcium deficiency will cause uterine inertia. So calcium, magnesium and phosphorus are really critical to muscle function. Uh, and so if we have a, a lack of calcium or magnesium or phosphorus, you end up with this condition called uterine inertia where the, um, the uterus becomes less responsive to stimuli and so less able to contract. Uh, and so going through that process of lambing or um, parturition uh, becomes more difficult. And so you can end up with the case where the um, lamb is half out, but not uh, fully out because the muscles have given up. And this can purely be a lack of calcium in the diet or magnesium or phosphorus. Uh, the fourth point here is poor growth in lambs. And so if lambs are achieving less than 130 grams a day uh, in that post lambing period through to weaning, uh, you're more prone to having a poor growth rate. Uh, and this in turn can lead on to bone fractures. Uh, and so rib fractures is uh, part of what I did my PhD study on. So ribs will fracture quite readily, uh, as will long bones, actually, if the animals end up being calcium deficient, uh, partly because they may not have got enough calcium during pregnancy because the ewe was calcium deficient, but also if they're not on a, getting an adequate calcium diet uh, post lambing, uh, this is they're predisposed to uh, bone fractures. And the last point here is osteomalacia. Or, or common, which is the adult form, which is a malnutrition where there's not enough calcium in the diet, uh, or rickets, which is um, the same condition, but referring to it in young animals and, and children for that matter, where that lack of calcium in the diet predisposes to weak bones. And so here is a, a pelvic bone with normal calcium content. So it's radio opaque or you can't see through it effectively. Whereas this is a, a pelvis where they are, are suffering from osteomalacia. And so the, um, there's a lot more translucency. In other words, x-rays will pass through the bone. Anyway, that's enough about the range of calcium deficiencies, specifically talking about use in confinement or containment, should I say. Uh, so what we see here is it's caused by a calcium deficiency in that last six to eight weeks of pregnancy. As I referred to earlier, the um, requirements for calcium are quadrupled, but, but it hasn't been addressed. Uh, and this is particularly a problem with grain feeding because uh, grain is notoriously low in calcium. Uh, and so without a calcium supplement, animals on grain for more than about four to six weeks are going to end up with calcium deficiency. Uh, and this picture here illustrates it, where these animals uh, are suffering from a um, hypocalcemia uh, and typically got the legs sprawled out the back. Uh, and they may remain alive for two or three days, but will eventually uh, succumb and die. Uh, it's also introduced by um, grazing crops and uh, lush grass uh, because often these are lacking in calcium as well uh, without a, a calcium supplement and also any stress such as yarding or droving or holding animals off uh, feed for a period of time uh, and especially in the last week, four weeks prior to lambing will predispose to hypocalcemia and sometimes it gets mixed up with hypomagnesemia um, too or grass tetany. So the signs, they appear dull and depressed, um, actually not dissimilar from that matter from uh, an acidosis. But in this case, the legs typically are often sprawled out behind. The animals try to crawl along. Uh, they become, uh, once again, recumbent on their chest, uh, on their brisket, and, uh, and lose their appetite and often will usually die within one to three days if not treated. Uh, the other illustration here is that animals that succumb to 
uh, milk fever, you'll often find they've actually got plenty of body fat. So that's quite different from uh, twin lamb disease where they use up all their body fat. But often it's the animals with twin pregnancies that are the ones that are most susceptible because they have the highest requirement for calcium, meeting the needs of two fetuses as opposed to one. How do we treat it? Uh, 100 mil of uh, four in one injected under the skin. So four in one comes in various names, calcigol, minbul, um, uh, et cetera, readily available from um, stock agencies, ag resellers. And, and so the uh, a pouch of minbul or four in one is usually about 400 mil. So a quarter of a pouch under the skin, you may give it twice a day and maybe for more than one day uh, to get those animals back on their feet and going again. Often you'll get one treatment, we'll get them going if it's only a mild dose, a mild uh, concern. Uh, it's also a good idea to follow up with a calcium drench. So once again, you can buy calcium solutions, um, which is a higher concentration of calcium. So sustain the animal for longer. Uh, and sometimes you may be a good idea to give some propylene glycol, a bit of a long acting energy solution as well, just in case it's complicated with um, uh, low glucose intake, so ketol or acetol or a number of others are on the market. Preventing it, um, whoops, uh, is uh, providing uh, calcium as a supplement in that last eight weeks of uh, pregnancy and also vitamin D is a good idea. Vitamin D encourages better uptake and, and utilization of calcium. So vitamin D and calcium intake uh, go hand in hand uh, as a synergy. You can provide calcium uh, easily as a stock lime uh, and a good idea is to provide a bit of dolomite as well which includes calcium and magnesium uh, and sold as an, as an appetite stimulant so that should be 40 40 20 I notice um, but uh, that, that's a good homemade blend you can make or otherwise you can buy proprietary mixes um, uh, from stock feed manufacturers uh, and trace element um, or should I say mineral suppliers. So Cole yeah, there's a question here does that yep. like that would be someone asked, is that a calcium magnesium supplement that would be similar that you might buy? Yes, would yes, that's provide right. Provide the same. Yep. And yeah, calcium enough. magnesium. Yep. While they're calcium magnesium. Home. Yep. Yeah. What you get off mineral suppliers, uh, stock agent, uh, stock firms. Um, yeah, they often have a um, a pregnancy, a pregnant you lick or a mix or block, uh, and that's usually got adequate calcium magnesium in it. Yep. For when they're feeding both on hay and grain, that's adequate. Yes. Yep, yep thank for sure. Thank you. Yeah, look, I wouldn't uh, rely on hay having any more calcium than what grain does, depending on what type of hay it is. Even legume hay, which supposedly has high calcium, if you're growing legume hay on calcium deficient soils, it's going to be calcium deficient. So you can't assume that legumes necessarily have high calcium content. Uh, the other point here is, yeah, so avoid stressing use in that last four weeks of pregnancy. Any sort of stress will bring uh, these sort of conditions on. Uh, Rightio, moving on to enterotoxemia or colloquially known or commonly known as pulpy kidney. So this is a uh, the most common cause of sheep deaths and for that matter cattle deaths. Uh, and the reason being that uh, this little uh, rod-shaped organism uh, is normally present in soil as a, a spore and so it can last there for years uh, or otherwise it's commonly in the gut as well. But as long as the uh, gut uh, maintains a healthy throughput. In other words, um, you know, they have a regular diet where things are, are passing through in a normal rate. Um, it doesn't get a time to get established, but uh, it becomes a problem. So the um, it's a Clostridium perfungens is the particular organism in the case of heterotoxemia. It's got a few relatives like uh, that cause hetero, uh, cause tetanus and black disease, black leg, um, malignant edema, crowpick, botulism, etc. They're all part of the same family. But in this case, um, uh, so this bacteria, if it gets a chance to get established in the gut, and that's usually as a result of a, a sudden change in diet, or the animals are held off feed for a period of time, or they change from one type of feed to another, in other words, going from hay to grain, or from grain to green feed, uh, that's enough to cause a disruption to the normal throughput. And uh, and especially uh, and introducing hungry animals onto feed, especially to grain, they'll gorge themselves. That'll cause a disruption to the flow. And you only need about a four hour change in throughput enough to get these uh, bugs that are normally present in the gut to get established, uh, release a toxin, 
uh, and that's uh, causes sudden death. You may get to see the animal before it dies. And in, in the case, it's looking like a, a, a horse with colic standing alone with a painful gut, head down, legs out, spread wide. Uh, but usually you just find them dead because that toxin is so rapidly um, destroys the, um, the nervous system. And uh, so sudden death and commonly um, they will bloat and uh, rapidly decompose because the toxin, because it's spread throughout the body, the, the body's almost starting to decompose before they die. And so animals are, are found often with this blood tinged froth at the nostrils. And that's because the uh, toxin causes a lot of gas. So the belly blows up, you get this comp compression on the lungs. And so it forces uh, the froth out. The froth is a result of the animals dying in extremis. In other words, they were panting a lot before they died, um, but they die suddenly. So you don't actually see paddling. The legs haven't moved much. They've just effect effectively fallen on their side. They blow up and rot pretty quickly uh, and you'll get this uh, blood tinged um, fluid coming out the nostrils. Uh, the blood is a result of damage to the blood vessels. And, uh, and typically they'll go purplish blue in the groin and if you go to uh, cut them open, they're more likely to explode on you. So uh, it's called pulpy kidney because if you open them up, you'll find the kidneys are pulpy, but so is everything else. So it's a bit of a, a misnomer. Treatment, uh, really none recognized. If you had antitoxin on hand, you would be, maybe be able to save a few, but that's very expensive and generally not available in Australia. Uh, you could try high doses of penicillin. And if you get in very early, you may be lucky, but um, uh, usually uh, not the case. So prevention is uh, vaccinating with a five in one or six in one uh, before they go into containment or as they go into containment, assuming they've had a previous dose that's uh, primed them. Uh, and you may consider another one pre-lambing, uh, like four weeks before lambing, if um, if there's a significant gap between pre-containment and uh, pre-lambing. Okay, so vaccination uh, to prevent error of, of toxemia and tetanus and, and the others that I mentioned previously. Uh, so normally we rely on, if you've given the U a, a dose of anti, uh, should I say, vaccine, uh, prior to lambing, uh, they will then pass on antibodies in the um, milk, in the colostrum, and that will provide the lamb with a protection for the first four to six weeks of life. But that's only a transitory protection because it's um, as long as the effectively the antibodies from the colostrum will last in the system. So you really need to give um, lambs a dose around about six to um, six to eight weeks of age, assuming they've already been covered for the first six weeks. In an actual fact, if you give a vaccine early in that lamb's life, back here in say two to four weeks, it will actually be cancelled out by the maternal antibodies. So there's a disadvantage in giving lambs a primary dose, a primary vaccine too early because it uh, may negate the benefit obtained from the uh, antibodies in the colostrum. But normally you give the uh, first dose to lambs around about six weeks onwards, and then a, that'll provide them with around about two or three months protection. And then you need to give a, a second booster, a secondary dose or a booster uh, at around about, say, eight to 12 weeks or it's around about weaning. Uh, and that should provide a 12 month protection. Now, I say should because if they're not subjected to too many changes in diet or stress, uh, transport, yarding, all those sort of things, that um, booster dose should cover them for uh, most of the next 12 months. Uh, given that this this brown line here is the level of protection. However, we do know that um, animals put under undue stress, uh, whether it's um, fasting, a lack of feed intake, or it's a significant change in diet, putting them onto lush loosen or green feed, it's a good idea to give a booster. And so they recommend actually a booster every three months. If these animals are getting chopped and changed from uh, different diets, or being withheld from feed and then putting onto lush feed, et cetera. Uh, another critical thing to remember is that um, we only want to use a quarter inch needle. So barely go through the skin. That's all we're trying to do, go through skin. We're not trying to go into muscle. Uh, we normally use an 18 gauge or even a 16 gauge. So you can actually get a, a good uh, one mil squirt in, in with minimal effort. We normally go into an area that's not a prime meat cut. So we go in behind the ear where the uh, wool is short. So don't use a half inch or a three quarter inch needle into the spine because when we see that 
will end often come across animals that have got spinal abscess where someone's jabbed the needle in close to the spine uh, or even into the spine uh, and caused the animals to uh, have convulsive activity two or three weeks down the track and, and have significant deaths. So um, quarter inch needle is uh, critical, nothing more. Okay, so moving on, I just want to mention here pregnancy toxemia. Now this wasn't on the list, but the reason I mention it is because a lot of people get enterotoxemia and pregnancy toxemia confused. So perhaps it's better to talk about pulpy kidney in the case of enterotoxemia and twin lamb disease in the case of pregnancy toxemia. But uh, in reality, pregnancy toxemia is caused, it's not actually a toxemia as such, it's actually controlled starvation. In other words, the animals are not getting sufficient energy in the last six weeks of pregnancy. So if you're supplementary feeding, you're not giving them enough. So they're digesting their own body fats and they're slowly wasting away. And if they've got twins in them in particular, or triplets even more so, those, those uh, lambs are draining a lot of energy and that you will go downhill very quickly. And when you do a post-mortem, you'll find there's no body fat at all. The liver is really pale from all the fat digestion. Uh, and uh, so it's actually effective where they've starved over a period of weeks. Uh, same signs as with acidosis and with um, uh, uh, with calcium deficiency, they're dull and depressed, become re recumbent and inappetent and die after one to three days. But typically, if you do a postmortem, you'll find they've got twins or triplets. Uh, there's no fat in the uh, gut at all and uh, very pale liver. Treatment, usually unsuccessful. If you think about it, they've actually been on a, a low plan of nutrition for several weeks. So you can't just give them a jab of gear and uh, and get them back on their feet. They usually need treatment over the next one to two weeks of a um, sustained glucose uh, solution uh, under the skin or intravenous to really uh, get them to rebound. And so most people don't uh, will, will give up. But you can give 100 ml of 4 in 1 under the skin. That's providing them with calcium, magnesium, uh, phosphorus and a bit of glucose so that's not really enough to uh, but it's a uh, it's a help and you might give it um, all of it would give it intravenous initially um, that's difficult to do unless you're trained in that field uh, but the more critical thing is a um, 100 mil of propylene glyco glycol which is that acetone or or ketol twice daily uh, and so that's really providing all their glucose needs but you'd need to continue for several days, if not um, well over a week. The principle here is to prevent it. So maintain use in at least condition score 2.5, uh, preferably three uh, through pregnancy and, uh, and even above three if you've got twins, depending on where you are. If you're in, a, in the lower rainfall areas, keeping them at least uh, 2.5. And, uh, and once again, don't stress them during that latter stage of pregnancy because that will certainly bring on um, the likelihood of uh, hypocalcemia, milk fever, or this uh, uh, pregnancy toxemia. Next, uh, moving on to uh, prolapses. Now, I've actually, um, as I said, I've just been going around lamb feed lots the last couple of days, and I've been doing it the last few weeks, actually, uh, doing postmortems um, for this pneumonia vaccine development. And uh, almost 100% of lambs I've found with prolapsed rectums uh, have pneumonia. Uh, and so I suspect it's very much the same in use, but uh, commonly uh, it's blamed on dust or uh, it's blamed on uh, short tail length, which certainly are factors. And also there is a breed susceptibility as well. But uh, when we see prolapses in late pregnancy, and as I say, it can be rectum, it can be vagina or uh, or it can be actual uh, the gastrointestinal system, the um, in intestines coming out. So it's primarily because the animal's got a very tight abdomen due to the advancing stages of pregnancy, especially with twins or triplets, and often there's a lot of fat in there as well. Uh, and so the uh, weakest point is going to give out, and that's usually uh, either the rectum or the vagina. And uh, and so these animals are usually in excessive condition often score four, condition score four or greater. Uh, it's often animals that are more likely to have twins and triplets, so crossbreds and maternal breeds. Um, but I would hazard without um, guessing too much that often these animals may be harboring pneumonia. It may not be clinically evident, so they may not have a snotty nose or they may not be coughing, but often when you see the lung, 
a third or a half of the lung has got uh, pneumonia as well. It's a very common problem in sheep uh, and often not detected until um, they go to slaughter. In the case of lambs in feedlots, they're always the ones that are the poor doers and take longer to finish. Uh, and so here we have a case uh, of a ewe with a rectal, uh, looks like, actually it looks like a vaginal prolapse at uh, pasture, uh, where in this case it's actually one that's actually prolapsed it's all its intestines. So it's come out through a, um, either, probably through the, um, the vulva, um, although sometimes they actually do rupture out of the abdominal wall as well. Uh, and so this is uh, obviously fairly well beyond repair. Uh, some animals will intermittently um, prolapse a bit of rectum or a bit of the uh, vulva, uh, vagina uh, and then it's, it sort of gets sucked back in, but it may become permanent. And unless it's dealt with, these animals are going to be terminal. And uh, and so either they should be euthanized or um, or you attempt to deal with it. And, uh, and especially those that rupture the intestines, well, there's really uh, not much hope for salvaging them. Treatment. Um, so, look, you can replace, especially if it's a, a rectal or a vaginal prolapse, you can actually replace it uh, as you would with the um, the vagina or the or the reproductive tract post calving, and uh, and you can apply restrain retraining restraining devices. So there are plastic devices that will keep things in place. Otherwise, this illustration here is just where a um, a corded strap has been placed. Uh, so it crossovers a, crosses over above the tail and and under the udder, so that it actually applies tension to keep those uh, valve, walls of the vulva together. Um, or you can do the same with the rectum. Uh, and so this is the harness um, when it's been fully applied. So it's actually crossed over above the tail. It's crossed over below the vulva uh, to cause those um, uh, the the lips of the vulva to be closely opposed. So if you've replaced the um, vagina or the rectum uh, and then that strap is actually holding it from prolapsing again and that may be just enough to get the animal through to carbon should I say lambing uh, and uh, and hopefully then once the uh, pressure is off uh, there won't be any further predistribution but these animals uh, may well have uh, torn ligaments that hold things in place and so they're probably recommended for a cull um, after they've had a lamb or raised a lamb. Prevention monitor the the diets and condition score of these animals to ensure they don't get too fat. So keeping them uh, under a condition score of four. Uh, for further advice on condition scoring, I recommend you do the uh, the Lifetime U program or, or source the um, some training from someone who, who knows. So condition scoring, we normally, uh, in the case of looking at condition, we is a euphemism for fat. We're really doing a fat score. But in this case, we're looking for the uh, fat over the uh, lumbar vertebrae. So we're feeling for the fat uh, along here on the um, transverse processes of the six uh, lumbar vertebrae, and also the fat cover over the vertical spines of the uh, six lumbar vertebrae. We're also feeling for fat over the eye muscle here. And uh, so when we say we want to keep them at a score two and a half to three or better, no more than four uh, out of a score of five, uh, and so, yeah, there's a, it, you need to be have that demonstrated and practice it. But it's a, it's a really good measure. Animals that are in confinement, you should be looking at um, doing a fat score, or should I say a condition score on, say, preferably 30 to 50 animals um, every two to four weeks, just to see that the ration that you've got them on is actually meeting the needs of the, of the mob. Uh, and it's by far the best method of managing, um, you know, nutritional status in pregnant use. Uh, and interesting to note that each condition score, we round it off to 10 kilograms of fat. We might split the hairs and say, okay, a merino, it's seven kilograms of fat. In a crossbred, it's 10 kilograms of fat. But that roughly equates to 300 megajoules. And if you think a ewe with twin lambs at the point of lambing needs 30 megajoules of energy a day. In other words, 10 kilograms of fat is one condition score. One condition score will actually feed, um, you know, 10 ewes uh, at the point of lambing. So uh, that condition score is a very valuable fat store uh, to enable animals if their diet is not being met by the um, energy intake, um, you can make up for it with a bit of uh, fat off the back, so to speak. And so when we talk about uh, ideal condition score for lambing, 
So we normally say around about score three. In other words, there's a, you can barely feel those short ribs if you run your fingers over them or barely feel the, the uh, lumbar spine here. Uh, but you can see these animals are nicely rounded, not too fat, and so they're very in robust condition to go into uh, uh, lactation and meet the needs of, um, of potentially twin lambs. To put more, more of a detail on that before we go into lambing issues. So if we talk about uh, ewe mortality, uh, especially in the lead up to lambing and condition score, so we can say that if animals are maintained in a minimum of 2.5 condition score, um, potentially you shouldn't lose any more than about three or four percent of twin lambs or one and a half percent of single lambs. Uh, and in the case of um, animals that are in a lighter condition, so if they're only about score two, uh, you can expect that the the loss of singles will be at least uh, double that, so up around 4%, and the loss of twins will be almost doubled, around about 6%, because these animals won't have enough energy to meet the needs of lambing and lactation, and for that matter, uh, lamb growth in the latter stages of pregnancy. To uh, look at that another way, uh, we can say that um, the pre-lambing condition score, and this was um, done on about 5,000 ewes, so we see here that the mortality rate drops off quite steadily when you get down to about three to three and a half condition score. But once you get into condition score four or more, the um, U mortality rate goes up again. And that's because of these other conditions such as um, uh, rupture of the, uh, the guts um, or um, these ewes are more, more prone to having dystochia or difficult lambing and, and dying during birth. So uh, yeah, this ideal condition score is around about three, three to three and a half is that's where you've got the lowest ewe mortality and also the lowest lamb mortality. So the latter stages of um, containment, we really need to be focusing on keeping these ewes in this condition here so that they're primed to go into lambing. So when we talk about lambing issues or dystochia, uh, difficult birth, uh, essentially, the probably the most common cause is the fact that there's a lack of room for fetal rotation. So all uh, fetuses, whether we're talking human um, or calves or, or lambs or kids or whatever, um, they tend to rotate in the latter stages of pregnancy uh, to go into the normal position. So this is the normal presentation, uh, the head and the two forelegs uh, coming out um, in this fashion. But if they aren't allowed to rotate because of confined space, uh, then we'll end up with animals coming out either breech or one leg forward or two hind legs forward uh, and uh, a head back and so forth. And so all these are going to be difficult to get for the animal to uh, give a delivery. Potentially, if you've got two hind legs coming out, they can deliver it. But if and and obviously the normal presentation, but all these other presentations are going to be problematic. Uh, you can actually have hormonal interference that will cause dystochia too. For example, if they're on estrogenic clovers or medics, uh, that, that can actually, the hormonal interference will, will impact on the animal's ability to go through parturition or lambing. Uh, and so you'll often have animals dying with a lamb uh, half out uh, unless it's been attended to. So it's that uterine inertia similar to what I referred to on a, a low calcium diet. Uh, and um, ideally, we avoid lambing using containment uh, as used prefer to be off on their own when they do lamb. And then also it reduces disease risk, as I'll come to shortly when we talk about um, some of the infectious causes. So signs, if, uh, if the water bag is present at the vulva and hasn't burst and the lamb hadn't been delivered within about 20 minutes, uh, I wouldn't hesitate to go in there and, and pull the lamb out. Certainly, that's what we do with calving. Lambs are no different. So if you've seen that animal off on its own straining to lamb uh, for a half an hour or more and uh, it hasn't done the job, I would actually go and stick my hand in there and pull the legs out or make sure the legs and head are pre presenting. Uh, and if you do see one leg out or a head and one leg out, obviously there's a difficulty there. And so you need to get in there and help it. Uh, and I guess preferably people with small hands, uh, it's a lot easier. And the other one is if you see a tail hanging out, well, obviously it's a breech birth, uh, and so they do need help. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to lamb on their own. 
uh, from a treatment perspective, um, and I must admit here that often people say, look, leave nature to its devices. If, um, if the ewe dies having a lamb, well, that's just bad luck. But often it can be uh, a human error in terms of having them too fat or um, calcium deficient um, and multiple births limiting the space. So I, uh, I don't really subscribe to the idea of leaving it to nature to take its course, because uh, if you think of the value of ewes and lambs, they are coming back up again after a bit of a dull spot last year. But um, uh, I think it's well worth intervening. Uh, and so often it's no fault of the animal that they are a malpresentation. It can be a nutritional aspect, uh, either too much nutrition or it can be a, a mineral deficiency uh, that's presented that way or, or just a, a bit of misfortune. So um, and a, so not much hassle to go in there and help. So from a prevention perspective, um, close monitoring of use uh, to detect and treat early. Um, and so if you see this situation where you've got a swollen, swollen head out in one leg, well, you know that that lamb is going to be most likely going to be dead if it's already got a swollen head uh, and the ewe is going to die as well. Uh, and so, you know, you potentially lost two or $300 if you don't intervene. So whether you've got 20 pet sheep or or 20,000, uh, I think it's well worth the effort to um, check on animals occasionally, if nothing else from a welfare perspective. Campylobacter, or commonly it was used to be known as vibriosis. Uh, so Campylobacter fetus uh, is the main causative organism, uh, but there is also another one, Chijuni. Uh, and I'm hasten to add here that fiddling around with a lot of these reproductive infectious diseases, uh, they are also zoonotic. In other words, you can, can acquire these infections as well. So don't just go in there boldly with um, bare arms and, uh, and a bit of soap and water. If you're doing any assisted births, I would suggest you use gloves or at least make sure you um, wear a face mask and give your arms a good scrub afterwards. And if you've got any cuts or abrasions, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be going in there uh, without gloves on. So um, the main cause of infectious uh, abortion in South Australia is uh, Campylobacter. I mean, there are others. There's uh, uh, Toxoplasmosis, uh, Salmonellosis, uh, and uh, Chlamydiosis, for example. But uh, Campylobacter is certainly the most common one. And uh, it's usually as a result of ingestion of contaminated feed or water. Uh, it may be um, recent introductions of contaminated or sheep that are carrying the organism. Yeah, high stocking rate um, encourages a greater risk. Stress is also a greater risk. And look, occasionally you hear a neighbor has actually had an abortion storm and then and birds and foxes or whatever have carried membranes across the vents. And so then the neighbor gets, gets the problem as well two or three weeks later. And so if you see a, um, some premature uh, lambs lying around the paddock, stillborn or uh, prematurely uh, born uh, with a few membranes laying around, uh, you'd have to be suspicious that there may be an infectious abortion occurring. Now, abortions can be caused just by stress alone, so it doesn't necessarily have to be an infectious, infectious organism, uh, but it's something to be wary of. So if you're seeing abortions in that last six weeks preterm or before birth, uh, pregnancy is, uh, should I say, parturition is due, or if you've got stillbirths, a uh, number of lambs being born dead, you'd have to be suspicious. And uh, if you find an abortion and then two or three weeks later, you have a, a few hundred ewes going down aborting, well, you know, you've got a problem. So uh, it's a good idea to take cognizance of, um, or take notice of lambs that have been stillborn in the paddock. And if it's above you know, one or 2%, I'd be saying, well, perhaps we need to be looking a bit more closely at this, perhaps spread the ewes out. Uh, or if you knew which ewes actually had, had stillborn lambs, I'd be um, isolating them from the rest. Uh, and actually, I'd probably move the ewes out of that paddock because all these um, dead lambs and, and aborted membranes uh, are going to be highly contagious. And as um, sheep and cattle are, they tend to be inquisitive and come up and sniff around here and they'll pick up the infection pretty readily. Uh, and if you see ewes with membranes hanging out, um, uh, and sort of no live lambs, that's also going to be obviously a suspicion of a, an abortions, abortions occurring. So treatment, um, I realise it's near impossible to isolate affected animals, but that's the ideal. Uh, reduce the stocking rate, so you're reducing the risk of spread, cleaning up aborted material and fetuses, 
uh, antibiotics of marginal value because generally um, often the, the problem will have occurred, the animals will be infected and an antibiotic at this stage is not going to do much good. Uh, some people try it, some people don't. Uh, you may give blanket antibiotics so the animals that haven't been a, haven't aborted, but um, yeah, you never know the stress of getting them in may, may actually bring things on. Uh, there is a, a Campivax vaccine in, in Australia. Uh, and so people, um, and there is a lot of herds around, should I say flocks, around South Australia now that have actually had uh, Campylobacter uh, abortions. And so they now routinely uh, will vaccinate with Campivax, um, generally your maiden use. The thing about uh, a lot of these infectious abortions is that the animals acquire a, essentially a lifelong immunity once they've had that problem. So it doesn't tend to recur in the adults, uh, but maidens that are introduced into the flock that haven't been exposed to the uh, bug um, are potentially susceptible. And so you'll see this um, a range of fetuses um, that um, are more full-term fetuses as a result of uh, these infectious abortions, but they only represent probably 10% of lamb loss as a general rule. Um, and management issues are far more important. Uh, how are we going, Jodie? Uh, Time-wise, we're all okay? Yep, no, we're doing great. Thanks, Cole. Okay. Uh, so pink eye, uh, it's actually, uh, once again, it's a bit of a misnomer, but I won't uh, bore you with the um, the long term, the uh, veterinary terminology. The uh, the cause of pink eye is uh, there's a half a dozen different organisms. The most common one in sheep is actually a bit different to cattle. So mycoplasma is the uh, most common cause of pink eye in sheep, uh, but mycoplasma does occur in cattle uh, and uh, about cattle, it's not the main cause. And uh, so what we tend to see is uh, an ulceration. So this, the cornea becomes cloudy. Uh, the cloudiness just represents fluid or inflammation in the cornea. And of course you see this influx of uh, blood vessels as well. Uh, all breeds are susceptible, considered to be spread by dust and flies and grass seeds. But interestingly enough, you can actually see it in the middle of winter just as much as you can in the middle of summer. So I think this, this isn't the, the be all and end all or the main causes. I think a lot of the time it's just poor immunity. Animals that haven't had a, a well-balanced nutrient diet, hasn't had it, have had their um, share of uh, vitamins and trace minerals. Uh, and so that can be as a bigger problem in summer as it can be in winter. See, uh, so what we see, severe conjunctivitis, uh, that ulceration as I referred to, cloudy cornea, uh, and most animals do recover in you know, one to two weeks, but uh, some develop this particularly nasty um, inflammation uh, and uh, the eyeball may rupture. Now, and interestingly enough, this is actually scar tissue, it's not a ruptured eyeball, so that actually can recover, but it will actually always have a bit of a scarring on that eyeball. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, they're blinded at this period. And so if they run into a stick or something, they're more likely to rupture it. So that's one of the downsides. Treatment. Now, traditionally, people have used purple spray, the old eye spray. And look, that's um, next to useless, in my opinion. Oxytetracycline only lasts uh, in the blood system for eight hours. So if you give them a squirt in the eye with, with purple spray, which is oxytetracycline, uh, not much is going to be absorbed and it's all going to be gone within eight hours. Uh, and so really, unless you're treating them twice a day or three times a day for a few days, a purple spray, you might as well sp squirt it in the windows uh, in the eyeball. Uh, not to mention, you can imagine what it's like having that squirt in your eyeball. You wouldn't like it yourself. Powders, similarly, are pretty useless. They just clog up the eye and actually probably impede healing. You can get pink eye ointment. Uh, which has a long-acting uh, antibiotic, uh, orbanin, but the uh, long-acting orbanin is actually doesn't treat mycoplasma. Uh, it's actually more effective in cows because that's or cattle because that um, the long-acting orbanin is useful there. So the pink eye ointment may work in some cases in sheep, but um, essentially you're far better off to give them a shot of the long-acting oxytetracycline. So tetroxy or alamycin, but you've got to go the long lock acting one that'll last in the blood system for about three days. And that's usually long enough to um, uh, effectively cure these sort of uh, situations. Alternatively, cut up a bit of uh, your genes, uh, make it into a little top hat uh, and glue it over the eyeball. 
So effectively, you're keeping sun and dust and flies and whatever out of the eye for a fortnight. Uh, and by the time that um, drops off, the eye will have uh, healed. So that's another way. You can actually buy little um, cones or top hats. You don't want it lying flat on the eyeball because that's just going to make it worse. It's actually going to scarify the uh, cornea and, and potentially make the eye worse. So it's got to be tented up away from the eyeball. Prevention. Um, Close monitoring of sheep uh, to detect any early signs and ideally um, treat those animals and preferably even spread them because if it is being spread by flies and dust, it's actually going to go from the infected ones to the non-infected ones. Uh, there are certainly animals that are going to become susceptible. So just like any um, disease or vaccine program, some animals uh, have an innate immunity uh, or a genetic immunity, but also vitamin A uh, protects the skin from a lot of infections and uh, and skin, including the cornea. And so vitamin A, and it usually comes to the DNA um, injections in that um, as you put them into confinement, um, that lasts for about six weeks. That's another way of reducing the risk. That also um, uh, helps with uh, lambing, parturition. The uh, vitamin D improves calcium utilization, so you get uh, better contractility. Vitamin E is a uh, disease preventative. It, it's a uh, immune stimulant, so that improves the animal's protection against uh, both um, diseases around the time of lambing, but also um, from pink eye. So uh, summing up, uh, we uh, I think that's getting pretty close to my uh, end of story. And uh, so just to summarize them, Grain feeding, so including uh, a lime, dolomite, a salt mix as a, a routine or buying your uh, pregnancy uh, blocks and licks such uh, with high calcium, high magnesium um, is a good idea as, a, as just a general supplement. The lime is providing calcium, the dolomite provides calcium and magnesium and the salt is an appetite stimulant. Uh, alternatively, you, some people just put out a uh, stock lime and salt mix, um, depending on where you are. If you're in a um, higher rainfall area, I certainly recommend magnesium supplement as well. Vitamin A, D and E, uh, preferably given in that latter stages of pregnancy for the reasons specified. The clostridial vaccine uh, is a good idea just once again to protect the ewes in the latter stages of pregnancy because they're under more stress at that point in time. A lot of the uh, protein the animal is eating is actually going into the uh, fetal development, uh, the flesh, uh, the flesh development, uh, as well as the um, eddy bodies uh, to go into the colostrum uh, is all protein. And so um, if you've given them a, a, a pre dose with this vaccine, it's going to be uh, means the animals better protected and will also have a, um, a more useful colostrum for the lamb. Uh, immediately post-birth. Providing uh, ad lib hay, straw and roughage just as a, a, a backup, I suppose, to ensure that they uh, have got enough in their rumen so that they're not getting um, uh, predisposed to acidosis or um, grain overload. Uh, providing macro and trace element supplements uh, either as a drench or a lick or uh, even as a water medication. Uh, and so some of those water medications, for example, you only need to put um, in the trough every uh, six weeks. So, uh, or um, having a, an ad lib um, loose mix, uh, which you can either get made up yourself or otherwise uh, buy it from uh, the the stock feed manufacturers, uh, uh, resellers and egg resellers, uh, whichever is uh, most suitable. But I think um, you can't, give an animal uh, too many minerals and vitamins uh, in that latter stages of pregnancy. And it's quite a contrast to uh, cows where we actually advocate not providing calcium in that last um, one to two months of pregnancy to encourage their bones to um, uh, you, uh, provide their calcium stores. But in the case of sheep, they don't actually have a lot of calcium stored in the body. So they're relying quite heavily on what they consume. And uh, as I said, grain is low in calcium dry feed is low in calcium, and for that matter, uh, lush green feed is also low in calcium. So they're really only getting an adequate, adequate calcium in the diet in the latter stages of winter spring, 
when the plants are fully developed roots and extracting the most calcium from the uh, soil. And especially in acid soils, calcium is notoriously deficient. Uh, and so the plants and animals are going to be deficient as well. On that point, uh, I'll finish up by saying uh, ideally post containment uh, for lambing, uh, the situation will be hopefully like this. Plenty of green feed on offer to ensure the animals uh, or the ewes are able to produce plenty of milk um, and uh, meet the needs of the twin lambs. So on that point, uh, Jody, I'll pull up stumps. Thanks, Cole. Cole, we had a question um, right from the beginning. We were talking about the nutrition, like the needs of um, ewes at different stages. Um, yep. And someone said, how much, how much would those numbers vary for twin, for um, ewes with twins? Okay, yeah, so if we say uh, in the case of a, a late pregnant ewe in that last six to eight weeks, it needs about 16 megajoules a day. Uh, a ewe with a single lamb uh, will be one and a half times that. So that's about 24, 25 megajoules a day. And a ewe with twins is double that. So it's going to be around about 32 megajoules a day. So if you think about a... Uh, if we just say, for exa example, a kilogram of barley as fed, uh, and I'm make the uh, point there that um, when we have a, a a feed test done, uh, you might find that barley is around about 12 megajoules per kilogram of dry matter, but as fed, uh, just the same as the um, the oats and in the silo or the um, corn flakes in your pantry they've all got 10% moisture in them. In other words, our normal environment has got 10% moisture. So everything, every feed that's available has got 10% moisture in it. Uh, that's obviously you know, preserved feed. Uh, and so instead of barley having 12 megajoules when you feed it out, one kilogram of barley will have 10% less. And so it's only got 11 megajoules. So effectively, uh, if we say a ewe in the latter stages of pregnancy, Ideally, would need to be eating about one and a half kilograms of barley to entirely meet their energy needs. Uh, once they come through with a single lamb and need twenty, say twenty-five megajoules a day, that's actually going to be, you know, just over two kilograms of barley a day. And a ewe with twins would actually need uh, nearly, well, nearly three kilograms of barley a day to entirely meet their energy needs. Now, that's going to kill the ewe. You'd, you'd never do that. That's why it's important to have ewes in good condition so that they've actually got at least 10 kilos of fat on their back that they can utilise when they cannot possibly eat enough grain to meet their needs. And uh, and so that's why we say ewes should be in score three or better, uh, three, three and a half, uh, so that they, um, if they're only eating, say, 15 megajoules a day from their diet, they can get the other five or 10 megajoules from utilising the fat off their back. And so we expect the ewes to lose a half to one condition score in the next um, two to three months uh, during la uh, lactation as their uh, lambs uh, grow. Uh, and so, yeah, the uh, requirements for a ewe with twins is about peaks about 20 days post lambing. So roughly three weeks post lambing. And that's going to be around about 30 to 30 five megajoules a day. Uh, and so that's why it's so important to uh, have them in good condition. You don't want the ewes to be utilising any more than half the energy requirements coming from their fat. In other words, you want at least over half the energy to be coming from their diet. So that's where it's important to, in the case of uh, grain feeding to meet their needs with grain. But ideally you're putting them on a green feed, which is quite an energy dense diet. So they're getting more than half their energy from uh, green feed or grain. And so no more than about a third, less than a half of the energy coming from uh, fat off their back. If they're utilizing too much fat, that's when they go into uh, twin lamb disease or ketosis uh, and uh, very difficult to retrieve them from that. Yep, on the same slide, Cole, is there enough phosphorus in the grain, um, you know, barley that they're feeding sheep and use for late pregnancy? Uh, generally there is, yeah. And so I might, um, I've mentioned here that um, grains typically have a calcium phosphorus imbalance. So all living things with a, with a skeleton you know, from a um, flea upwards uh, needs about two to one calcium to phosphorus in their diet. 
and uh, and so typically grains have a one to two ratio. In other words, it's inverse. Uh, and if you think about that, we always put out phosphorus to ensure grain uh, grows. We don't necessarily always put out calcium. And in fact, a lot of our cropping soils are actually acidic soils with a calcium deficiency. Uh, and that's why we tend to find grains are, are typically uh, two to one phosphorus to calcium instead of two to one calcium to phosphorus. Uh, and so we need to provide that extra calcium. But generally, grains are going to have a, an adequate phosphorus intake because most people ensure that they get good yields by um, putting out phosphorus supplements. Uh, and so we don't need to generally supplement phosphorus um, in that pre lambing period. Um, Cole, our last question is related to camp, camp fee. Um, and the question is, what's the ideal vaccination program or timing for camp fee? Now, I'm happy to take that on notice or if you're... Uh, yeah, no, that's right. Um, yeah, so normally, uh, like all vaccine programs, uh, we, uh, well, perhaps I'll go back to the illustration here. Um, this can just as equally apply to uh, Campylobacter as it does to heterotoxemia. Now, the idea is that if a ewe has been exposed to uh, Campylobacter uh, and it's got a natural immunity, it will actually pass some of that immunity on to the lamb, but that's really of no value because um, you know, the lamb is not going to be the one suffering the abortion. But the important part is that a ewe with a protection uh, will not suffer that disease again. And the uh, it's actually the problem with the maiden use. They come along and uh, if they haven't been exposed to Campylobacter prior to joining and they acquire that infection during pregnancy, they are highly likely to abort uh, before full term. And uh, and so you need to give them the same as a um, any other animal and a vaccination program. You need to give them a primary dose and then a secondary dose um, four to six weeks later. And then that should last that animal uh, through that pregnancy. And uh, we talk about a, a population immunity. So just like with COVID, we, um, we basically were all meant to get a vaccine so that 90% of the population was covered. And in effect, um, uh, to a certain extent, we are spreading virus uh, amongst ourselves and, and providing a, a certain degree of population immunity thereafter. The same happens with the Campylobacter. If you've had a Campylobacter abortion storm go through your flock, uh, there'll be a level of immunity there thereafter. And it could just be that um, your maiden ewes will get exposed to that virus, uh, uh, sorry, should I say bacteria, and will not uh, then subsequently suffer the risk of getting infection and, and abortion. But if you've, but that's a, it's a risky period because you don't know if those uh, maiden ewes are being exposed or not. So ideally, uh, you would do the double vaccination program uh, in your maidens. Uh, and thereafter, if you've had campy in your flock, there's a fair chance that there'll be an ongoing immunity that will keep them protected thereafter. But each time you bring in your maidens, um, giving them a, a double dose of campy uh, prior to birth uh, but, uh, or, or during Ideally, perhaps that joining and then um, four to six weeks later, that will give them uh, protection through that first pregnancy. Uh, and thereafter, you'd hope that population immunity will sustain them. So you're really only focusing on giving your maidens a vaccine program. Um, some people take a risk and say, OK, well, I've had an abortion storm. You know, I, I lost a thousand lambs or whatever. And, you know, this, the, the bacteria is going to be in my flock thereafter. And hopefully with having your maiden use mixing with your adult use they're getting exposed but that's it's a bit of a lottery you can never be sure colin um, another question here how long does the camp fee and bacteria exist for uh so yeah campylobacter can potentially survive on pasture uh in moist conditions for several weeks uh so i guess when um, normally most lambs are going to be on on green feed and so and especially if it's in membranes or in an aborted fetus, potentially it could survive for a few weeks. Uh, but once it's dried, dries out, um, yeah, that's the end of it. Uh, so it's unlike heterotoxemia, which forms a spore that can survive for years um, in soil and pasture. Uh, the campy is, uh, requires moisture. And, uh, and so you'd expect if um, sunlight, ultraviolet light, um, will knock it off pretty quickly. But if it's in a moist environment, 
it can persist much longer. Yeah. Thanks for that, Colin. And I might um, say, if you want to know more about Campfy, um, there's some more information on the Sheep Connect AWI Extension South Australia website. And um, there's also a few webinars that we've recorded on Campy in particular. So please go back and revisit those. If you can't find them, flick me an email and I'm happy to send those out to you. Um, just a reminder, today's webinar was recorded. Um, we'll upload the recording in the coming days to the AWI Extension South Australia YouTube channel. And we welcome you to revisit that webinar yourself or share it with um, colleagues. I wanna thank everyone who's joined us for tonight's webinar. And in particular, I want to thank Colin for sharing your insights and expertise. If you've got any other additional questions, you can contact me directly using the contact information on your webinar registration. Um, we thank you for your time and, and have a wonderful evening.